What's going on everyone? My name is Jasmine. On today's episode of The Slain Project, we're going to be talking about the 1974 murders of three Navajo men in Farmington, New Mexico. These killings would become known as the Indian Rolling Deaths, and a lot of people compare them to the murders of African American men in the Deep South during the Civil Rights Movement. And the people who confessed to killing these Navajo men got a very lenient sentence and it angered a lot of people. And if you would like to see more videos on missing and murdered indigenous people, click that subscribe subscribe button and the notification bell. Now let's get right into it. Farmington, New Mexico is located next to the Navajo Nation and is just off the reservation. In 1974, the native community was prevalent in the south side of the city. According to the 1970 census in San Juan County where Farmington is located, the Native American population was roughly 34%. It was estimated that native shoppers contributed to about 50 to 60 percent of the retail business in the city. Even though the city's non-native owned businesses depended on native spending, they were often not treated respectfully. Many Caucasians assumed that all natives were on welfare and they were just spending their tax dollars. They also expressed anger because they received free health care on and off the reservation. Violence against native people in border towns like Farmington has been and is a common occurrence. Border towns often have a lot of liquor stores whose target customer base are natives. As a result, there often is a large indigenous homeless population in border town cities. When the bodies of three native men turned up outside of Farmington, many people were shocked at the heinous crimes. On Sunday, April 21st, 1974, a family was picnicking in the Choke Cherry Canyon area, six miles north of Farmington. At about 2 p.m., they stumbled upon the body of John Harvey. He was 39 years old and from Fruitland. He was last seen around noon the previous day in a Farmington bar. Later that same day on Sunday, two teenagers were walking about one and a half miles from where John's body was found and found the body of Herman Benali at about 6 p.m. He was 34 years old and from Kirtland. Herman was last known to be at a bar around midnight. Six days after these two men were found, a third body was discovered in the same general area. David Ignacio was 52 years old and had an address listed at the Blanco Trading Post. Reports say that David had been dead for approximately two weeks when he was found. That would place his time of death about a week before John Harvey and Herman Benali. All three of these men were beaten and had their heads smashed with large rocks. Reports say that these men had their clothes removed and that they were burned and mutilated. The mutilation was not specified, but their clothes were removed, so it may have included their private areas. What would be found out is that these murders were the result of thrill-seeking hate crimes towards Native men done by white teenagers. These murders would become known as the Indian Rolling Deaths. Survivors of Indian Rolling said they were assaulted with rocks, pellet guns, bottles, eggs, and baseball bats. It could not be determined if these three men found in Choke Cherry Canyon were robbed, but the term rolling is an old school term that basically means the same thing as robbing. One youth was even overheard telling a reporter that they roll the natives for welfare checks. At the time, Minister Henry Bird of the Navajo Nation Mission Church said it was known for years that high school students made a game of rolling drunks. He claimed to have spoken to some kids and they said that there was a secret club that focused on this activity. It was referred to as an unofficial sport for the white kids. Many people in town did not believe this and said it was a result of natives doing this to other natives. The Navajo said that these killings reflected the long-term attitudes held towards them. Most of the white population were sickened by these killings and called them hideous, inhumane, and senseless. Chamber of Commerce President Ron Buddy said the town would have felt the same whether the victims were native or not. 
He said that about 99% of the town's population said it was hard to believe that something like this could happen. There definitely were racial tensions in Farmington at the time in 1974, but some of the townspeople were in denial or did not see things the same way as the natives did. Wilbert Sosi was a member of the Farmington Intertribal Organization and said that he once drove through a white neighborhood and had five and six-year-old kids throw rocks at his car. Val Cooper was the editor of the Farmington Daily Times and said that they didn't understand where this racism came from and had no idea that stuff like this was going on. Chamber of Commerce President Ron Boddy is on the record stating that he does not believe the killings were race-based. Three white teenagers would admit to and be arrested for the three killings. On Wednesday, May 1st, they would be arraigned on first-degree murder charges. They were 16-year-old Howard Bender, 15-year-old Matthew Clark, both of these guys were arraigned on three counts, and 16-year-old Del Bollinger was arraigned on one count. All three were sent to the San Juan County Jail and put into protective custody. There were peaceful marches and rallies held by members of the Navajo Nation in protest of the racial aspect of the murders. The Coalition for Navajo Liberation claimed that the city refused to listen to their concerns and the rallies were the only way to get their attention. There were attempts made to work with the city of Farmington to resolve the underlying issues of the murders. The coalition stated that face-to-face -face negotiations were severed after the protests began. The protests continued for several weekends in a row and San Juan County Sheriff Dan Sullivan said that the people of Farmington were growing tired of it. Then at a city council meeting, the coalition made an appearance and Farmington Mayor Marlo Webb agreed to meet with them after a heated exchange. Before the agreed upon meeting, the coalition presented the mayor with a list of demands that he later labeled as unreasonable and not negotiable. Other concerns were also brought up. Number one, better housing for Indians. Number two, better treatment of jail inmates. Number three, Indian studies in school. Number four, investigation of liquor distribution on and off the reservation. The protesters wanted the liquor stores and bars closed because they targeted native customers. Alcohol on the Navajo Nation is banned and many of its members wound up in the border towns to drink. In present day, this is still true, except alcohol consumption is allowed at tribal casinos. Mayor Webb would try to remedy the situation by creating a 14-member Navajo Relations Committee that consisted of three Navajo tribal members. The Navajo Nation would then create a five-member commission on civil rights that would negotiate with the Relations Committee created by the city of Farmington. This angered the coalition because they believed that Farmington was going around them by cutting them out of the equation. They also believed they were the ones who truly represented the minority group in Farmington. The American Indian Movement, better known as AIM, also traveled to Farmington to help advocate. They called the killing senseless and called for a full-scale investigation. They also searched in a 10 to 30 mile radius around Farmington to make sure that there were not any more bodies. Coalition members then began receiving threatening phone calls that said if the marches do not stop, a fourth body would be found. After the teenage boys were arraigned on the murder charges, they were all given mental evaluations. The hearing was supposed to begin on May 25th, but was moved to June 7th because all the evaluations were not complete. Judge Frank B. Zinn of Gallup, New Mexico, oversaw the hearing on June 7th. The judge declined to let the media be present and would only allow it if one of the boys' lawyers requested media coverage, which no one did. The hearing lasted all day and the district attorney requested that they be tried as adults, but was ultimately denied this request. At the end of the day, 
Judge Zinn sentenced the boys to the New Mexico Boys School in Springer. They were to remain at this reform school until authorities thought they were qualified for release and not to exceed 21 years of age. The protests were peaceful until after the sentencing. Their permits to march were denied and the mayor had said that a previous permit for a sheriff's posse parade was already granted weeks prior. Officers from Fort Bliss, Texas were in Farmington for the parade and dressed in old Western cavalry uniforms. The Navajos attended the parade and there was a clash after they blocked a patrol unit. The Navajos were angry because of the racial insensitivity of the parade. Tear gas was used to break up the crowd and a Farmington officer was run over by a car. He survived and four Native women were arrested for running him over. In all, about 30 people were arrested and additional permit requests were denied after this event. The Natives believed their right to free speech was being suppressed. They challenged this decision and appealed to have the permits restored, but were not successful. In a New York Times article dated August 31st, 1974, Judge Zinn explained a little bit about the hearing and what influenced his sentence. He said that he could not release details of the killings publicly because of a state juvenile offender law. However, he did reveal that all three of the murder victims were found drunk on the streets and loaded into the back of a car. Judge Zinn referred to the homeless Navajos on the streets as drunkards and poor pitiful devils. He also added that the families of the native men could probably file a civil suit and win easily. He also said that one of the teenagers testified against the other two. New Mexico law at the time said that they could only be tried as adults if the court finds that there is no chance of rehabilitation. Since psychiatrists, psychologists, and prison officials said that the boys could be treated, they were tried as juveniles and granted the sentence of staying at the school until they were 18 years old. Judge Zinn stated that the molesting and killing of drunk Indians was not confined to Farmington. He could recall many stories of mass rape, assault, and murder in almost every border town next to the Navajo Nation. And this is very true. Around the same time the Indian Roland deaths occurred in Farmington, other similar situations were unfolding in Gallup. In February 1973, the mutilated body of Gilbert Saunders, who was 26, was found in a ditch near the Gallup City dump. In May 1973, the bodies of two Navajo men were found alongside a remote dirt road several miles north of Gallup. Key Emerson Jones was 54 and George Dennison was 47 and they were both found murdered and their bodies were described as mutilated. In June 1974, a woman making a U-turn at a cattle guard about four miles south of Gallup discovered three bodies when her headlights passed across the bodies. Zuni tribal members Andrew Aku and Arnold Selion were found, along with Navajo tribal member Alfred Yazi. All three had numerous stab wounds and they still had their wallets and jewelry, so robbery was ruled out as a motive. There also was not any mutilation to the bodies, so law enforcement believed they were not connected to the Farmington murders. Even though these men were not robbed, it still fits the description of an Indian rolling death. One of these men were also last seen at a bar like the Farmington victims. In May 1974, on the eve of a planned march in Farmington, a body was found in the San Juan River about eight miles west of the city. An elderly man on a walk sighted a male body in the river. He had no ID and was fully clothed. The man was described as about 40 years old. I could not determine if he was identified. And it was not clear if he was connected to the other rolling deaths. And another man was found shot to death in June 1974. He was found along Route 666 in the Twin Lakes area north of Gallup. He was identified as Herman Johnson, who was 19 years old at the time of his death.
The acts of violence perpetuated against these men in the 1970s resonate into the current day. Similar recent occurrences continue to happen in these border towns and in the city of Albuquerque. The FBI has recently released a list that consists of 192 missing Navajo tribal members, male and female. This list does not include all the murder victims, so this list can easily be doubled if you account for them. But no one knows for sure because there is no database to track this. All the men spoke about in this video are the ones I could find for this time frame in the same area, but there very well could be more victims for this time frame. If you know of anyone else who could be a murder victim of Indian rolling in the 1970s, please comment their name and year down below. Thank you so much for watching today's video. Let me know what you think in the comments down below. And if you knew any of these victims, please share any memories of them. And I will see you in my next video.